Well, hello everyone. I'm Stefan. I work at, the, at uh, Lightband on the Scala compiler team. And uh, hello, I'm Julien Richard-Foy. I, I work at Scala Center. And thanks a lot for coming. It's the last talk of the day. You must be tired, maybe. Yeah. So let's uh, start with a quick look at Scala 213. You've probably seen the keynote, so you, you've learned a bit already. And if you want to know more details about Scala 213, Adrian has a talk tomorrow at, I think, 3.30 in this room. So I'd just uh, give you a quick overview. The main topic for Scala 213 on the roadmap is the new collections library. It's the first time since Scala 2.8 that we're redesigning it, so about 10 years now. And we're also improving compiler performance beyond what we already did in the Scala 2.12 series. We'll, we've done some more work on modularizing the standard library, and we'll see a bit of the fallout uh, later in this talk. And finally, we're improving user friendliness, which means in particular improvements to the REPL and error messages and documentation. You can find a link here to the uh, roadmap on our Scala dev issues tracker if you want to see more details about this. And uh, as I said, otherwise, go see Adrian's talk tomorrow. So the current status is that we just released Scala 213.0 M4 almost exactly one month ago on the first day of Scala Days Berlin. We were aiming for that date to have a, a version with the new collections library out, and we managed to do it. And uh, there will be one more milestone before the uh, RC kicks off, and that's uh, milestone five scheduled to be released on August 10. This will contain some minor API changes that we're still doing to the collections, and uh, naturally more bug fixes. We're also working on performance testing at the moment, and uh, we're trying to catch possible performance regressions and fix them in time for M5. And uh, since we now have the chance to get feedback from people who are using uh, the new collections in M4, we can uh, do further improvements to compatibility and cross-building. So since you're here at this talk uh, about migrating to Scala 213, I assume you currently have a project that works on Scala 212. That's uh, our starting point for this uh, exercise. And you want to target Scala 213 milestone 4 or higher. So anything that has the new collections library. And uh, the examples that we're showing are going to be for SPT because uh, that's what we use ourselves. So before... Uh, diving into the migration and just uh, switching your build over to 2.13, it's easier if you actually start on Scala 2.12 and uh, make a few preparations there. So the first thing you want to do is uh, remove calls to deprecated APIs. There's a lot of stuff in the Scala library that has deprecated a lot of types and methods, and we removed uh, many of them in Scala 2.13 in particular so that we wouldn't have to port already deprecated methods to the new design in the collections library. So things like Java conversions, which was already deprecated in 2.12, has been removed. So if you're still using that, you should change your uh, calls accordingly. You can uh, see how to turn this on in the SBT build by passing the uh, dash deprecation flag to the compiler. So you'll get the error messages that tell you how to get rid of the deprecated calls. And once you have a clean build without deprecations, it's going to be much easier to migrate to 2.13. Another thing that we removed is a bunch of compiler flags. Most people probably don't bother with them, but uh, some may have used these uh, flags in their build. Those are all flags that uh, change the semantics of the source language that you can use. And we want to get rid of those to avoid fragmentation. They are uh, experimental features or stuff that didn't really work well in practice. And uh, from now on, the, the goal is to rely on the x uh, x source uh, flag in order to set a source level. So you can still tell the compiler in 2.13 to parse the source as 2.12 or as 2.14 with some features that we anticipate for 2.14, but we want to avoid further fragmentation. Uh, 
At the bottom here, you can see the link to the uh, pull request that removed these flags. So if you've used any of them, you can find more discussions about this in the, in the actual pull request. I'd like to point out one a flag in particular that we removed, and that's the dash y no adapted arcs. And uh, some people like that because it prevents an accidental argument adaptation that uh, Scala is doing. So uh, you may have uh, opted to turn that off to make your code safer. There will be a few changes to argument adaptation, in particular to the handling of auto-tuppling uh, coming in Dotty or Scala 3. And uh, we're trying to get uh, closer aligned with that in 2.13 and going further in 2.14. So the goal is to always allow the safe kinds of adaptation and always prohibit the unsafe one that can lead uh, to accidental behavior so that you wouldn't have to choose between allowing everything or not allowing anything anymore. And in Scala 2.14, uh, we want to align this completely with the rules that Dottie has already implemented. And uh, you can already get a preview of that in 2.13. If you set the source level uh, to 2.14, then uh, the automatic ADA expansion of zero arc methods will be disabled. So if you used no adapted arcs before, that's one thing you will probably want to do. So uh, you get a bit of the safety back. And uh, for methods that are that have an argument list, we're pushing for more aggressive uh, ADA expansion, like uh, Dottie already implemented. OK, the final change uh, is regarding modules. In uh, 2.13, we removed the Scala library all module. Is anyone here actually using that? I don't see any hands. I, this is the third time we're giving this talk. So far, nobody has raised a hand at this question, so nobody should be affected by the removal of this module. In case you're using it, maybe you don't know about it, you have to replace it with individual dependencies on the individual modules. We're also, we have also moved the parallel collections library into a separate repository, so it's now published as a separate module. And, uh, there are instructions uh, linked in this uh, issue here for cross-building up to milestone three. So this will not work at the moment for milestone four because the parallel collections have not yet been rewritten for the new collections library. Uh, this is a work in progress and will have parallel collections working again on milestone five. And by that time, cross-building should also be straightforward. And finally, Scala XML is no longer a transitive dependency of the Scala compiler module. So if you relied on that, you'll have to add an explicit dependency. You probably don't really care about that and are not excited unless you're working on the Scala compiler itself, in which case uh, I find this very exciting because it means that Scala doc no longer needs Scala XML and it will make bootstrapping the Scala compiler a lot easier for us. All right. Um, thanks. So now, how can you build with uh, 2.13? Well, uh, since uh, Milestone 4 has been published on Sonatype, you can just add it to your build uh, uh, as, you as you do with uh, other uh, Scala versions. And um, then if you want to use different compiler options uh, according to the Scala version of your build, in case you are cross-building for several Scala versions, you can use this expression. Uh, and uh, here, the important part is here, where we check that the minor version of Scala is uh, higher than 13. And uh, here, you, you can see how you can, for instance, uh, adapt the compiler option to get a similar behavior between uh, uh, before 2.13 and after 2.13. And then if you try to compile, um, most likely you will get some either um, compilation error or um, warnings uh, um, in places where you use collections. And um, otherwise you can maybe hit some corner cases um, where uh, type inference is um, in, in 
intertwined with uh, the usage of uh, singleton types uh, because um, some rules have changed in the compiler. So maybe you will see some error message uh, in that cases. And um, maybe you will have some, you will, you will hit some other incompatibilities uh, because uh, the level of uh, source language has changed. So a short term solution to overcome this problem is to use the X source 212 um, to temporarily uh, use a level of source language that's compatible with 212. And uh, in case you, you are using a project that cross build with several Scala versions, um, you might hit some problems because uh, in the new collections, the API is sometimes different from uh, what it used to be in the old collections. And uh, we cannot change the old collections because they have to remain uh, binary compatible. So what we did is that we created a compatibility library named Scala Collection Compat. And uh, this uh, compatibility library provides a unified uh, syntax that works in uh, 2.12, to 11 also, and 2.13. You can use it like this, just, uh, just add a dependency to the Scala Collection Compact module to your build. And uh, here I'm showing an, uh, an example of uh, difference uh, of uh, an, an incompatibility between 2.12 and 2.13. So this is how in the old collections we used to convert a collection to, a new co to another type of collection. And in the new collections, instead of, type, in, instead of passing a type here, like list, we now pass a value, the companion object of list. So obviously this line, uh, the, la the last line does not compile in uh, 2.12, but thanks to the compatibility library and thanks to this import that provides uh, implicit definitions in 2.12, uh, this code uh, now can compile with uh, 2.12 and 2.11 also. And um, on 2.13, this Scala Collection Compact uh, ob object, package object, is empty. Um, it's just uh, here so that the import works. So now, what's new in the new collections? Well, let's start with a quick overview of the uh, design goals for the new collections so that you get an idea of uh, what we actually want to do with it and what the good parts are before we get into the ugly parts of migrating. So um, the main goal here was to have a simpler user-facing API, in particular getting rid of the ugly can build from that always pops up in error messages and that required us to hide the real signatures of methods in the Scala doc in the past. We also made some internal changes that uh, make it easier to implement non-strict collections like stream. In Scala 2.12, you had to override basically every method if you implemented a non-strict collection. Otherwise, uh, you would accidentally force the collection because all the default implementations uh, assumed a strict collection, so we reversed that now. The default is lazy and we have special optimized versions that you can use for strict collections. We also simplified the internal hierarchy a bit. This is useful for implementers, of course, because your collections become simpler to write, but it also benefits everyone because the simpler internal hierarchy with fewer types means that uh, the Scala compiler has an easier job compiling your code and therefore it compiles faster. Okay, let's move on to the problems that this redesign causes. This one is actually a problem that many of us have been looking forward to. Scala.seq is now Scala Collection Immutable Seq. So we finally made the default Seq immutable, which many people have wanted for years. And the same goes for index Seq. It is now consistent with uh, Scala.set and Scala.map, which already pointed to the immutable versions in the past. Only Seq was the outlier there. 
Uh, I can't give you a general guideline on which one you use. It, uh, you really have to decide that on a case-by-case -case basis. In many cases, your code will just continue to compile as it did because you already assumed that uh, the default seek would be immutable and that's all you cared about and in this case you're fine. But in some cases, you really want to abstract over both mutable and immutable collections. So you'll have to use Scala collection seek explicitly if that's what you want. And of course, in order to cross build, you can just reference Scala collection seek or Scala collection immutable seek directly instead of relying on Scala.seq. So we're doing this change now in 213. Why wasn't it always that way? Why was Scala.seq uh, not immutable in the first place like the other collection types were? Well, the reason for that is var arcs. Var arcs are part of the Scala language specification, which is supposed to refer only to types in the Scala package. So Scala.seq is OK to use Something like Scala collection seek is not. And for var arcs itself, it would not be a problem. We can just use an immutable seek, but we have to interoperate with Java var arcs on the JVM. And Java var arcs use arrays, which are mutable. And therefore, Scala.seq was defined to be the generic seek, so it could abstract over both immutable sequences and mutable ones, like Java var arc arrays. Of course, in Java, while arrays are technically mutable, everyone who uses var arcs relies on them being effectively immutable. You don't expect to be able to pass an array to a method that takes var arcs and then modify it, possibly concurrently. Nobody is prepared for that, so they already have to be effectively immutable. So we're treating them as effectively immutable. So if you interoperate with Java var arcs, now we just pretend the array is immutable and wrap it in a new type that's called Scala Collection Immutable Array Seek. And you can do the same for your own arrays. If for efficiency reasons you want to have an array constructed uh, in a mutable way and then wrap it as an immutable seek, you can call arrayseek.unsafe wrap array. We still have the implicit conversion from array to Scala Collection Seek as before. Uh, this is not going to change, but of course, it's not a Scala.seq anymore because it's mutable. So there's another implicit conversion because there are many of these cases in your, in, at least in the code basis that we migrated. So we added this deprecated implicit conversion that makes a copy of the array. This is usually not what you want because in these cases, the array often is effectively immutable. So if you still have the deprecation warnings turned on from the first step of uh, upgrading to 2.13, you will get this error message or this warning message here that tells you to uh, call arrayseek.unsafe wrap array if you want to avoid copying. Or if copying is really what you want, then add an explicit to index seek call. OK, this one is uh, the biggest change in the new collections. There is no can build from anymore. Well, actually, there is one. It's called build from. It, it looks almost the same. The, the type is exactly the same, actually. The methods are a bit different. The, the new builder method used to be called apply. And the from specific iterable method is new. That's the one that allows lazy building instead of only strict building as a new builder. The crucial difference between can build from and build from is that uh, Built from always requires an instance of the source type. That's the from argument here. Can build from had another apply method that you could call without giving it a source. And uh, if you use build from, the source collection determines what to build. So you always have to use an instance of that. But in many cases, you don't care about it because you're not going to use it anymore. Methods uh, inside the collections library itself, like flat map on collection classes, no longer use uh, build from or can build from. They are overloaded now to produce uh, different results depending on the source type. We had to make some changes to the compiler to enable this. In 2.12, uh, you would have to, had to add many, uh, many explicit type annotations to make it work with overloading. So we improved the compiler to handle those cases, and now we can implement it that way. There are methods, however, that use it, mostly methods outside of the collections library, like future.sequence, 
You could implement future.sequence in the same way with overloading, but you would have to write four almost identical methods for almost identical overloads uh, to handle just the basic four collection kinds. And then when it comes to collection kinds like special cases like int map or long map, you still couldn't use them in the way you want to. So that's why we use build from for those. There's a second type, which also looks almost like can build from, and that's called factory. And unlike built from, factory does not take an instance of the source collection type. So instead of using this matrix of possibilities with can build from, that you can build based on the target type or the source type or whatever the source collection tells you, we have two clean paths now. If you use build from, the source collection instance determines what to build. If you use factory, the type determines what to build. So the general rule here is to use uh, build from to, uh, to rebuild a source collection with the best matching type. Otherwise, you use factory. I would like to give you an, an even simpler rule, which is if you have an instance of the source collection, then use build from, otherwise use factory. But of course, the one, the one important example that we use it, that we use uh, factory for in the collections library is a counterexample to that, and that's the method to in iterable. If you want to convert an iterable to something, you already have an instance of the source collection. That's what you want to convert, but you don't care what that is because all you care about what to convert it to, so you use factory and not build from. But uh, in either case, it's usually easy to change your code that uses can build from. If you have your own methods like future.sequence that take a can build from, in most cases, all it takes is replacing that either with a build from or with a factory. So with uh, can build from gun, there's also no breakout anymore. Breakout is what you use when you want to avoid building an intermediate collection in a method that takes a can build from, like flat map. Or, well, in this case, we're using map that's Map doesn't actually take a can build from, so the example doesn't quite work. But if you assume it's flat map, and you have access dot flat, flat map, and then you can pass a breakout to it to build a vector if you annotate the type. So in general, just use an iterator for that. That's the efficient way to avoid building an intermediate collection. There are cases where an iterator doesn't actually have the method you're trying to call. For example, when you start with a map and you want to call map values on it, in that case, you have to use a view. So um, if you have a method that takes a build from or a factory, um, which uh, does not really occur in the, in the uh, current 2.12 library, then you can... Uh, you rely on the implicit conversion of a factory object to a build from or factory. So the, this example doesn't quite work in 2.12, but what we're trying to do here is you start with a, with a list of future of int and you want to convert it to a future of vector of int. So you use future.sequence for that. And instead of relying on it to infer an implicit can build from, you pass it a breakout value and then annotate the result type as future of vector of int. The only reason that this doesn't work in 2.12 is that the type of the can build from is constrained too much, but it could be easily uh, made, work in, made to work in 2.12. And what you do in 2.13, and this actually compiles, is you just uh, pass vector instead of having, having it infer an implicit build from instance. And it's actually shorter than a 2.12 because you don't have to spell out the whole result type anymore. You just have to give it a value for the type constructor. So I, I already briefly mentioned views as a replacement for breakout. Views in 2.13 are very different from, from the old views. We basically removed the old views entirely and started from scratch. Fortunately, not many people are actually using views and 
if you are using them, you may not even notice the differences in practice uh, in the way you are using the views. So views in 213 are essentially reified iterator operations. If you're familiar with the Java 8 Streams API, you can think of the distinction between view and iterator as being similar to stream versus split iterator. So you use view to compose your operations on collections, and they are implemented by iterators. So you can just compose your operations in the abstract, and then when you actually want to get the data, iterate over it, the view goes to the source collection and fetches the current data from that. So you always get re reliable semantics for mutable and immutable collections alike. One difference with this design is that views are no longer tied to the source collection type or value. In particular, they do not remember the source collection type. There is still a method called force, which is deprecated now, that you can use to force the contents of a view, but now it always builds an index seek because we do not remember the exact type. So usually what you want to do is call one of the explicit two operations like a specific to list or to array or just a generic to in order to convert the view to whatever you want. One case where you actually may have encountered views, even if you didn't know it, is in map values and filter keys on map. So if you use those methods, they pretend to return a map, but it's actually lazy, so it should really be a view. And in 213, we made it a view. So if you see an error message when you're compiling on 213 that you get a map view where you expected a map, that's probably what's happening. You called filter keys or map values on it. So if you really want a map, then you have to call add a to map call to it. Okay, this is probably the biggest incompatibility, but uh, not many people are going to implement custom collection types. Who here is, is doing that in their code base? Do we have anyone who's implementing their own collection? One person. I see one, yes. One reason for, for that is, of course, that it's really hard to implement custom collection types at the moment. So this is going to be easier in 2.13. We simplified the type hierarchy. There's less boilerplate in general. And uh, there are a few other changes that are not necessarily easier, but make it different. Like uh, all the symbol symbolic operators are only aliases for alphanumeric names now. So instead of overriding the plus plus method, you now override concat. And of course, instead of writing a flat map that takes a can build from, you write multiple overloaded versions of flat map, or just a single one that augments the existing overloaded versions. But this means uh, there's uh, no realistic chance to be able to cross-build on 2.12 and 2.13 if you have your own collection implementation. So what you generally do is that uh, you use different source files for those and uh, just have two different implementations. So the way to do this in SPT is to have different source folders where you can place those files. You may not... Uh, I've uh, used this feature before or may not even be aware of it. I, I didn't know this for, for a long time myself, but SPT already provides these, this feature out of the box. So in addition to your source main Scala, for example, you already get a source main Scala dash with the Scala binary version where you can put your sources. So if you compile against multiple Scala versions, SPT will automatically pick up the sources from the right folder out of the box. Now, the problem with that is it's tied to the binary version, but that's not what we care about. We care about source compatibility here, not binary compatibility. So it's not very useful in practice unless you only want to build against exactly two different versions. Uh, if you want more, then you have to wire this up yourself. So we're doing it in the same way as we did with the uh, compiler flags example earlier. We look at the Scala version and then add to the so-called unmanaged source directories in compile. So in the example here, we have add two different directories called Scala-213 plus and Scala-212 minus, depending on whether you're compiling on Scala-213 or higher or Scala-212 or lower. So this was an overview of the 
the, probably the biggest or most important incompatibilities. There are a few other ones that you may encounter. We have an FAQ on the old collection Strawman repository that we used to develop uh, the new collections library where you can find more information about uh, possible incompatibilities. So, um, Stefan presented the incompatibilities that require some, some uh, thought to, to, to solve. And uh, hopefully most of, the, uh, most of the incompatibilities are not like that and they are quite simple actually to, to migrate. Um, in most of the case, that's just deprecation. So it tells us instead of using that, just use that because we have renamed something. And um, uh, when, when we have a simple case like that, we can automate them. So um, we are working on an um, automatic migration tool. The idea is that uh, if you have your application that works with 2.12, that compiles with 2.12, then you apply the migration tool to your, code, to your source code and um, it produces the, it updates the, the source code in place so that uh, the application now compiles with 2.13. This migration tool is implemented as a Scalafix uh, rewrite rule. In case you don't know Scalafix, that's a code manipulation tool that has been uh, developed at the Scala Center. And uh, so hopefully after you apply the migration rule to your code, you have uh, an, a project that compiles with 2.13, but maybe you will still have to migrate some of the remaining corner cases uh, manually. Uh, in practice, this looks like that. So first you add the Scalafix SBT plugin to your project, then you run a few SBT commands. So first, Scalafix enable to just enable Scalafix. And then you run the migration rule. So this is the identifier of the migration rule. And that updates your source code in place. Then you change the um, Scala version in your build. And finally, you reload the, the SBT uh, build and you try to compile. You can find the detailed documentation uh, in the GitHub repository. So what kind of um, migration do we support? Um, typically, renamings, as I've said. So for instance, for instance, here we can see two migration rules working uh, at the same time. Stream has been renamed it into lazy list and append has been renamed into lazy appended all. Um, so those kinds of rules are quite simple to implement. If you want to contribute uh, migration, mi migration rules, you are welcome. Um, okay, maybe this is, this is not the best example because actually lazy list is um, slightly different from stream, the, the semantics is slightly different because uh, stream has a lazy tail but has a strict um, head. And in the case of lazy list, both the head and the tail are lazy. So that's uh, a small difference that can change the behavior of your program. So actually, the um, migration rule that rewrites stream into lazy list uh, will become optional, so it will not be enabled by default. And then, what kind of other uh, migration rules do we have? Well, basically, anything that rewrites some expression into something else. For, exa for example, instead of uh, calling copy to buffer, now you just uh, concatenate all the elements to the buffer. So this is one example. And um, unfortunately, the more complex the expression to rewrite, the harder to implement the, the rule. So um, uh, there is a trade-off uh, that we have to, to, to do. And, um, and because of that, uh, some things 
are not in the scope of the migration rules. For instance, um, I will start with this one. Advanced usage of can build from because they might involve uh, very complex expressions. So we cannot find a, a, a generic way to, to say uh, how we should rewrite some usage of uh, can build from into the new, the new way. Um, also custom collection implementations because the API is a little bit too different. It's hard to, to find a, uh, an automatic way to, to migrate from the old collection to the new collection. And finally, uh, the usage of Scala.seq because uh, as uh, Stefan explained, now Scala.seq is Scala.collection.immutable.seq. And um, we, we cannot automatically migrate existing code because it really depends. In, in some cases, you really want to still uh, continue using uh, Scala.collection.seq, but maybe in some other cases you are happy to, uh, to use uh, the new Scala, Scala collection immutable uh, seq. So we, 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 we are not uh, going to take that decision for you. And uh, in the FAQ, you can find the exhaustive list of uh, what is currently supported by the migration rules. The example that I've shown was about migrating, uh, migrating an application. In the case of an application, usually you only care about compiling with one version of uh, Scala. But in the case of uh, migrating a library, the story is a little bit different because usually you want your library to cross-compile with several uh, versions of Scala at the same time. So for, ex for example, if you have a library that compiles with 2.11 and 2.12, then you want um, that your library compile with, with uh, 2.11, 2.12, and 2.13 after, um, after you apply the migration rules on it. And um, so we, we plan to provide a rule that will produce a code that, that um, cross-compiled with uh, 2.11, 2.12, and 2.13. But uh, we, we have not released that yet. And uh, yeah, just that's something that we are working on. Did I? Um, it's okay. Uh, so I think this is it, right? So in case um, you want to know more um, about the internal changes of the new collections, you can uh, read the documentation that, has, that is already online, and you can also check out um, this example of project that shows how to write code that cross-compiles between uh, 211, 212, and 213 using the collection compatibility library. Of course, you can have a look at the FAQ, which is, uh, to date, the most exhaustive uh, source of um, changes between the old collections and the new collections. And also, we have uh, two links uh, to our previous talks about uh, the new collections. So two. Thanks for Thank listening. You. Do we have time for questions? or? Are there any questions? Maybe not. Yes, I think you have to, to take the microphone. <laughs> I, I noticed on the slide uh, wh where you suggest how to migrate code that used breakout um, that you recommended using dot iterator. Um, did you recommend dot iterator uh, only because we might be cross-building with uh, old Scala versions where views don't work? Or um, even if I'm only in Scala 213, would you still sometimes recommend using iterator over view? Uh, yeah, that's a very good uh, point. So indeed, if you use uh, iterator instead of view, you, you are guaranteed to, to have uh, uh, the, behav the behavior that you expect to have because Sometimes in, uh, in, the, in the old collections, views do not behave uh, as expected. 
And um, so I think as long as it fits in one line, uh, going with iterator instead of view, I think it's fine. But if you have something more complex, um, maybe it's uh, just safer to go with uh, views. Yeah, I don't know what you want to say. Iterators also can also be a tiny bit more efficient yeah. because view is a wrapper around iterator. It's another layer on top of it. So if you only need to consume it once, you can uh, avoid creating that extra layer by uh, creating an iterator directly. But the difference is probably negligible in many cases. 